Hi, I am Rachel Romeliotis. I'm a senior editor at O'Reilly Media, and I am here with Simon Monk. He is a full-time author uh, focusing on open source hardware and has just authored so many great books. I am happy to have him here to talk with me today. Hi, Rachel. Okay, so how about if you're just getting started with Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. what do you really need in, to get started uh, in terms of both software and hardware? Yeah, I think if you're a complete beginner, it's well worth uh, buying one of the starter kits that most of the vendors sell. Because um, one of the more difficult things when you get a new Raspberry Pi is that you have to sort out an SD card for it to work with. So um, a lot of these starter kits come with a, an SD card ready formatted and ready to go. Uh, and um, all you need to do is switch it on uh, and away you go. No doubt, once you get a bit more used to the system, you'll probably end up picking your own distribution or updating it to get the very latest distribution. But certainly when you're just starting, that, that'll do you absolutely fine and, you know, in terms of uh, getting going quickly with mm -hmm. the Raspberry Pi. How about, I know um, people have selected different programming languages to use with the Raspberry Pi. What yeah. is your suggestion on sort of how to decide on what language? Okay. Well, I mean, the, the original um, motivation by the Raspberry Pi Foundation and, and the reason that the Raspberry Pi is called the Raspberry Pi is that um, they intended it really for school kids to be um, learning Python on. And Python is one of those languages that just has a huge uh, community behind it. Um, it's lightweight, so it runs well on the on the um, Raspberry Pi, you know, it doesn't need a huge amount of resources or anything, you know, which is, is one of the problems with trying to use Java on the Raspberry Pi. So I, I think Python is a great language, particularly if you're new to programming, to get going with. It's a bit, um, I mean, some sort of computer science purists will look at Python and sort of not be totally happy with the syntax and think it's kind of maybe a bit sort of slack in some ways. But I, I think that doesn't really matter if what you really want to do is get people started programming. So certainly for, for that sort of kind of audience, I'd go with Python. I think for, for younger kids and for kids who've never met any kind of programming, um, you know, a general, uh, you know, quite a, um, you know, a general uh, introduction is to use um, Scratch, the, uh, the graphical programming. Yes, I've heard language. of that. Yeah, and, and it's quite nice because, um, for example, a lot of the interface boards, uh, you know, like the, uh, the PyFace, have got um, libraries that are compatible with Scratch. So you can actually do some of the hardware hacking from within Scratch without having to resort out to Python. So I think for kids, you know, that's a great choice. And then, you know, for the real sort of real hard programmers who, who really want to sort of stretch themselves and do recompiling of kernels and all sorts of fancy stuff like that, then you've got C available because, I mean, after all, the Raspberry Pi is just a Linux computer. So anything you can run on Linux, well, or rather anything you can run on a fairly uh, underpowered Linux machine, you can you can uh, you can run on the Raspberry Pi. So uh, people, and of course, because it's got so become so popular, and it's got such a big community behind the Raspberry Pi. Then all these people who've got their favourite programming language, uh, even if it isn't already ported to the Raspberry Pi, it very soon will be because everybody kind of wants to be able to do everything they can on the Raspberry Pi. Right. Use their favourite software on it. <laughs> How about now? I would imagine the Raspberry Pi is better at some type of things than others. What are what are some good starter projects? Yeah, I think this is there's a lot, been a lot of confusion between the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino. A lot of people look at the Raspberry Pi and think that looks a bit like an Arduino. I can just do this the same kind of projects as I would with an Arduino. And really, it's kind of it's a different sort of beast. Really, uh, I think the sort of projects that really suit the Raspberry Pi are really are something that needs um, a screen. Uh, and a keyboard, or something that ne needs the wi you know Wi-Fi because it's very easy to add Wi-Fi to a Raspberry Pi with a little USB dongle. Um, because those are things that the Arduino can't do very well. So it makes sense for any kind of project where you're sort of effectively kiosking a little computer uh, to be done with the Raspberry Pi. Um, it's a it's um, it's a difficult one because the Raspberry Pi, when you look at it, and it's got those GPIO pins, and you think, all right, I can connect up loads of electronics to them, um, and you can, um, but it's uh, they are a little bit delicate in some respects. So you have to be a little bit careful how you use them. 
Um, and uh, in a way, the Arduino is better at those kind of really low-level things. Um, but the, the Raspberry Pi can do them. You just need to exercise a bit of caution. So can you actually use a Raspberry Pi with an Arduino, as you mentioned, or a BeagleBomb? Yeah, I mean, I think an Arduino and a Raspberry Pi are actually a very natural partners because, um, well, you can link them together very easily with a number of different routes. I mean, the Arduino uh, can be powered and programmed from a USB connection and exchange data over a USB connection. So uh, the simplest way to connect the two together is simply just plug a USB lead into your Arduino and the other end into the Raspberry Pi. And then you can, um, you know, you can communicate between the two. You can have the Arduino take care of the real hardware side of things, and then you can have, uh, because the Arduino has analog inputs, which, for example, for reading sensors, which is one of the things that the Raspberry Pi can't do. And then you can have the Raspberry Pi doing the bits that it's good at, which are, um, you know, displaying uh, data on a nice big screen or, you know, collecting input from keyboard or mouse or sending data over, over a network connection. I guess um, you can do that on, the, on Arduino, but you have to have a, an extra plug-in shield or something to be able to connect it to the Internet, whereas that's all already there on the Raspberry Pi. There's also um, some quite interesting, there's a very interesting board that's come out. Um, the name of it escapes me for the moment, but it basically allows you to, um, uh, it, it's, it's kind of an Arduino that fits, plugs onto the, Raspberry Pi, huh. and that allows you to plug Arduino shields on top of it. So you kind of get a sort of sandwich with a, an Arduino and a shield and this board in the middle, um, which is a, a you know a good combination. And that um, because you've got kind of a hard connection between the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino, you haven't got to have leads connecting the two up or anything. So th there's lots of interesting things going on where you know you're kind of combining the best of both worlds with the two technologies. It definitely sounds like a pairing. So, yeah. so you've obviously helped a lot of people with your books. Uh, yeah. Can you share some sort of common issues or mistakes that you've run across that will help people avoid them? Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, th there are lots of sort of problems uh, that, that people have sort of around sort of setting up uh, uh, wireless networks and things, so they might, um, you know, get hold of the wrong kind of, uh, of network uh, of uh, USB Wi-Fi adapter, for example, um, and so you end up wasting money because you buy an adapter that there's no driver that will work with the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and a very common problem is lots of people have monitors that will have um, VGA um, input on them, um, but the Raspberry Pi doesn't have VGA output; it only has HDMI output for its video. So you can buy adapters um, and you can buy them on eBay for a few dollars um, that claim to, you know, that have the right sockets on either end, but when you actually come to try and plug them in and get them to work, they won't work. Yeah. So I think it's very, um, before you go out and spend money on some peripherals like that, then you need to just check for compatibility and make sure you're getting something that will work. I mean, one of the ways to kind of guarantee it, I suppose, is to, buy from the same, you know, the same supplier you buy the Raspberry Pi from, and then, you know, you, you kind of know that you're getting something that will be compatible with it. How about, um, how about some sort of uh, expert tips when you are up and running that help you get some good either, you know, performance or something you didn't expect out of the Raspberry Pi? Yeah, I, I think a lot of people, when they first start the Raspberry Pi up, um, and they maybe load up some piece of software, uh, you know, maybe try out Abbey Word or something like that, or um, GIMP for image editing, uh, and it just seems quite slow. And one of the features that you have on the Raspberry Pi is when you, you first boot it up for the very first time, it takes you into this configuration tool where you can choose a number of options from on there. Uh, you know, you can do things like sort of rescaling the screen so that it fits properly. Uh, and one of the options on there that is well worth doing, and it's probably the first thing I ever do whenever I set up a new image on the Raspberry Pi, is to, um, uh, to turn on the overclocking. Because overclocking sometimes sounds like the sort of nasty, hacky thing that people do in their bedrooms and cook their hardware because they just, you know, over, you know they're making it run faster than it was designed to. But actually, the, the overclocking on the Raspberry Pi um, is quite smart in that if it starts to get too hot, the Raspberry Pi, um, it just drops the clock rate back down again. So you can't really do any harm 
with the overclocking. Um, and it does mean that um, you can get a sort of gigahertz performance out of it rather than the 700 megahertz, which does make a, a, you know, a big difference uh, just to you know, getting it uh, working a bit more quickly, um, especially when you start to run you know, fairly heavyweight programs like GIMP. Uh, anything like that, it will make quite a noticeable difference. So, similarly, games, you know, if you, if you do that, uh, if you do the overclocking, it will make them much more, uh, much better for performance. Cool. I've got one bonus question. So I mm -hmm. assume that you've seen some really, really cool projects. Uh, so I was wondering if you could tell us about one or two, and also sort of, is there a place online where people can go to check them out? The, um, well, you see a lot of people when they've, they've made a project, you'll find them on the Raspberry Pi bulletin boards, on the, you know, the official Raspberry Pi uh, bulletin board. Um, and of course, um, you know, you find uh, uh, lots of things on Instructables and all over the place where, where people have made projects. So they're, they're good places to, to look for them. And it's a good sort of source of inspiration as well. If you're thinking, I want to do something with my Raspberry Pi, just trawl along there. And, and of course, YouTube, if you type Raspberry Pi projects into YouTube, you will get <laughs> pages and pages and pages of it. Um, I think some of the ones I like uh, best are kind of the ones that sort of go to the strengths of the Raspberry Pi. So things like the sort of where people have made a vintage games console. Nice. Because that's kind of a, a great uh, Raspberry Pi project because you uh, you can plug in a little um, screen, little low resolution screen into it. Um, but you can also have the proper controller. You can get hold of an old vintage, uh, some vintage buttons and a vintage joystick controller, and then you can interface them with the GPIO hardware and have them actually do some, you know, um, you know, use them to make a, a proper little games console. And there's nice games emulators available for the, for the Raspberry Pi that so that you're effectively playing the game that you were playing in the 1990s or, or 80s even in some in some cases. Um, and, it, and it's just running a, a ROM image on your Raspberry Pi. So I think that kind of thing is, is a lot of fun and the sort of thing where the Raspberry Pi really wins over. Um, I think another cool project is where it is there's, there's a whole um, open source project, again, the name escapes me, that, that's looking at using the Raspberry Pi for home automation. Um, and it's really a great idea for that because it's kind of a, an excellent hub for your home automation because you can run a web server on it so you can see... Uh, you, you know, you can basically control your house from any uh, web-based, you know, any device with a browser. Just um, get it, get it turning lights on and off, and uh, doing all those kind of kind of neat tricks with it. Cool. I think I'm actually going to try the um, the game, the vintage game thing, because that sounds really cool. Oh, okay. Well, thank yeah, you so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me. You're and, welcome. And. Um, you know, uh, we have a book with you, obviously, and mm -hmm. uh, it's called Raspberry Pi Cookbook, and we're going to have early chapters out this summer, and then we'll have the book out in the fall, so people should look out for that. Okay, thanks very much. All right, thank you so much.